lot of people don't really understand something that's very fundamental to my understanding of magic, the spirit world, and pretty much everything that I do. Now, I'm pretty famous for talking about non-duality, and uh, you know that's a giant topic. You'd be better off looking up uh, Advaita Vedanta and listening to the various books of that. Look, you know, reading them, listening to them on tape, uh, listening to Alan Watts, listening to any number of people who are known for their non-dualistic philosophy. So I won't go deep into that. There are many different interpretations of that. Um, however, I am a very specific type of non-dualist. I'm sort of my own self-created version, but I'd say I probably lean closer to what's in Advaita Vedanta with a little bit of Neoplatonism mixed in. Neoplatonism is a little bit more um, mechanical, a little bit more, uh, we'll say, rational, whereas Advaita Vedanta is every bit as rational, but it's more spiritual feeling, um, whereas Neoplatonism is a little bit more logic-oriented. Um, it's, it's a little bit more dry, we'll say. It's a little bit more Christian-oriented because you have this concept of God even within that, potentially, much more friendly. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, it is a little different. It's a little bit more like, um, you know, a little bit more spiritually divine. It's, a little bit, it's just a little bit more um, internal. You know, it's not as cerebral. It's more of a feeling, I guess is the way to put it. Whereas Neoplatonism is definitely more of a thought that becomes uh, an enlightened manifestation. Advaita Vedanta is more of a feeling. You can, you can do exercises, you can do things um, and come to conclusions and have these powerful experiences. Not that you can't in Neoplatonism, I just think it's a little bit more approachable uh, in the, the um, Advaita Vedanta way, in, in the Vedanta sense. I think it's a little bit easier to do, especially for someone who's not as intellectual. All right, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about something that's a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, especially among newer practitioners. And that is the, ver the, the veracity, the, 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 uh, the worthiness, uh, the, the reality of the spirit world. And what is it? What does it mean? How do we access it? What are spirits? What are they really? What are we talking about? Now, this is a bit of a dry subject if you're not careful, and I'm going to do my best to try to keep it exciting and interesting for you. But many different cultures, many different metaphysical philosophies have postulated that the individual soul is made up of many parts. And one of the problems is if you're a non-dualist is you recognize that each one of those parts and pieces are also you. There is no separation between them, but we identify them as separate and individual because to do so makes them easier to understand. I often talk about how a lot of what we do in spiritual magical work is sort of like disassembling something to fix it. Um, so our intellect, in order for us to understand things with our brains, we literally have to chop things up into things, into smaller things. It's a kind of atomism. The more you can chop things up, the smaller it gets until eventually um, the pieces that you've made are about the same size as the very, very edge of your knife and you can't cut it anymore. So you have to get a sharper knife. So that's kind of what science does, is it takes reality and it digitizes it. It chops it up into smaller and smaller ideas, pieces, concepts, um, literally pieces in, in many cases. And it tries to find out what the true nature of reality is by cutting it apart. The reality is you can't actually cut it apart. All you're really doing is creating differential context for each concept. Um, you're, you're separating the concept from the truth that it is. When taken as its whole, it's kind of like the saying, seeing the forest for the trees, right? Um, it, it, a a non-dualist is attempting to do both at the same time, whereas a scientist is trying to reconstruct the forest by examining the individual trees. And the, the person who's maybe in a more dualistic sense is, um, or, or uh, we'll say maybe pantheist sense, uh, is trying to understand the trees by knowing the forest. The non-dualist sees the forest and the trees as one thing. Uh, it sees it as one interconnected web of organism, not organisms with an S, an interconnected web of organism. Uh, a non-dualist understands themselves to be one with the trees that are around them. So for example, I, I said I wouldn't get deep into this, but it's, it's a necessary thing I gotta do for a moment. When I breathe, the oxygen that I'm taking into my lungs is at least partially a product of the plants and trees in my environment. And by a matter of, we'll say, uh, a leap of, 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 of um, con conceptualization, we could argue that trees are then an extension of our lungs. And so 
in reality because we could not live without that relationship to the tree. The tree is us. We are also part of the tree. And that is just on the fundamental level. We haven't even gone to the spiritual level. We're talking about the as below side of the dichotomy of as above, so below, the, the Baphomet symbolism, which I'm very fond of. Um, you are the Baphomet, as I often tell you. Um, so when we're talking about the spirit world, we are talking about not a thing that is separate from the as below. We're talking about a thing that we have identified with our intellect as being separable, as being uh, definable as separate. It is not technically separate though. There is not this state of, of disconnect. In other words, a lot of magicians, a lot of lower, we'll say, uh, lower attainment people, I hate to use those words because it sounds very rude, but fuck them. I don't really care because that's how I think. People who are on a lower level of attainment look at reality as a separate duality where there is a firmament, there is solid physical objects, and then there is the airy ether all around in which everything swims. And there is somehow some nebulous connection between the two. They can't figure it out. And they tend to separate them out so that they can understand them, but then they forget that they are both the same thing. So in other words, I'll take this ring, okay? This ring is made out of matter. And this matter is really formless and void. It is a, it is a, is a blob of stainless steel that has been stained a little bit and shaped, right? And it is, it is really a, a chaotic pattern. It's a, it's a random blob of energy that's, that's been condensed into what we call matter. The fact that it is a skull, however, exists only in the spiritual world, and I'll tell you why. The thing that we call a skull, as you see here, is not a factual object. It is an idea that we apply to the shape of what this is. The idea is the spiritual part, and the idea is based on, at the very large scale, what we call archetypes. And archetypes are fundamental forces of nature. The skull is a very, 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 at the end of a, a lot of divisions and wearing a lot of masks, the skull is a symbol that is related to the archetype of death. So we have the archetype of death, of decay, of the hidden, because the skull is hidden behind the flesh, of these kinds of archetypes. And when we look at a skull, all of those big archetypes filter through this small little symbol and the symbol shapes them and you see in your inner mind, in your inner heart and soul, this skull has an effect on you. That is the spiritual. So the material and the spiritual are really one, however, because all of the things that I've described are dependent upon each other. The idea of death requires that there be a material that changes, not dies, but changes from one form or another, and the situation in which we experience it ceases to be. That is death. Death is, is dramatic change. It is an ending of one concept, one experience line, one, one pattern, and the beginning of another. Now, in our limited human awareness, we think that those are separate events, separate things. In the grand scheme, they're all part of a working whole. Remember the forest for the trees analogy. So if I were to say, death is to spirituality uh, what, a for what, a, what a tree falling in a giant forest is uh, to the forest. Um, it is, it, it, the fallen tree is still part of that forest. It is still part of the big, the big whole. In fact, you couldn't have a forest without fallen trees because those fallen trees provide the nutrients that create more trees, right? In the same way, death, change, is an important part of the entire fractal pattern of reality. Without this concept of change from one form to another, ultimately, you can't have the big picture. You can't have the ultimate picture of reality. You need this. So this makes death, and death itself is actually, uh, I'm going to cover this in a second, but, but death itself is actually just a smaller little piece of a much bigger archetype. So the big archetype, the biggest archetype, the, the center archetype, the, the one from which death radiates, is the archetype of change. The archetype of change is represented in many other archetypes. The spinning wheel, for example, is an archetype of change. Death is an archetype of change. Growth, birth, all of these things are archetypes of change. 
they're all smaller little masks that the archetype of change wears. Now, the archetype of change, the way I'm describing it sounds mechanical. However, the archetype of change is not mechanical. It is ultimately sentient and aware and conscious because everything that is, is conscious because it is all consciousness. It is all conscious. It is all aware. And so when we make the separation of, say, death from the archetype, that's incorrect as well. We need to understand death as a mask or represent, representative of the sentient archetype of change. And the sentient archetype of change by itself is a mask for the whole. It is a mask for something even deeper and more fundamental. The hard part is human beings are only able to go so far into our rationalization of these archetypes. There, there are, this is like what Jung called the collective consciousness and the collective unconscious and so on. What we as human beings are able to conceptualize changes and grows, I believe. I think that the sphere, the bubble, if you will, of what humanity can understand both expands and contracts in different ways, depending upon what time period you're in, what culture you're in, the individual, and so on. You know, people living in the Middle Ages had no conceptualization of the internet, and so therefore the collective conscious that includes the internet didn't exist, so that little part of the bubble wasn't quite so big. Um, but maybe at the same time, the bubble was bigger in other areas. People were more likely to understand what animal husbandry was really all about because everybody had to work on a farm or something. Okay, so this collective consciousness swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, and it's filled with different human perceptions that we anthropomorphize into things like gods and forces of nature and souls and spirits and spooky little, uh, you know, urban legends, shadow people, all of that stuff. I'm the first to admit that shadow people exist but don't exist. They, they don't exist in the sense that you can materially prove them. They exist in the sense that people can experience them. And sometimes there's things that are caught on film which could be, you know, examples of their manifestation. Just like when I do magical ritual, I do things which, you know, you'll see weird things happen with the flame, you'll see weird things happen with smoke, you'll hear weird noises that I obviously didn't cause, you'll see me do weird movements, um, and I've seen weirder stuff than even that I've caught on film. Things I can't explain. People mistake those weirdnesses for the spirit world. That's not by itself the spirit world. The spirit world is in front of you all the time. It's part of everything you see all the time. No matter how mundane the thing might be, it itself is blinding. It is a blinding light already. You simply cover it with the ideas, the anthropomorphizations that you give it. Um, humanity sees reality as only humans can. No other being in the universe sees reality quite the same way as humans do, and no human sees them the way you do. So we each have our own personal anthropomorphized reality, our own subjective sphere of reality that applies to us and nobody else. So what does this mean for the spirit world? The spirit world, when separated out from the Baphomet whole, when we separate it out and we treat it as something separate, it's useful for conversation. It's useful for writing grimoires. It's useful for entertainment. It's useful for all of those things. But at some point, you have to recognize that the separation of self from the astral and spiritual, the separation of self from the material even, are all unhealthy practices. This is one of the reasons why I created the Trinity of Self. It was meant to show you that you are part of this entire thing. This is what you are. This is what everything is. And you are just one mind, which is represented on one of these three symbols here, and it's specifically the one in the corner up there. This would be the body and that would be the spirit. You are representative of the mind, of the singular identified mind within the pattern. And this pattern repeats infinitely. It goes in and out over and over and over. You are the mind which observes and thinks and categorizes these things. When I say observes, I don't mean in the, the observer sense. I mean in the you create by way of your mind the reality that you experience. But you are, in totality, the consciousness that is all things. So mind, this is where it's going to get a little off the rails. Hopefully I don't get you lost too much. Mind is represented mostly by things like memory. Because memory is what creates personal identification. Without something like memory, you cease to exist. Now, what I'm here to tell you is 
you as a consciousness never cease to exist. However, your memories constantly die, fade, and change. However, memories for a time take on a life of their own. Now, these memories are the things of egregores. Memories are the building blocks of what an egregore is. Without memories or functional ideas that are remembered and therefore evoked through magical or psychiatric methods, egregores are based upon ideas which are remembered and then brought back up into our collective consciousness. Egregores exist in our collective consciousness, either the grand, the grand collective or even just a small local collective. So for example, the Goetic entities generally don't exist to people who don't believe in them, who don't know about them, who have never experienced them or heard of them. The Goetic spirits don't exist. You can send one to them and they will probably have less really experience of it than, than anybody else. It doesn't mean that they won't influence their lives per se but they themselves won't recognize them. They won't experience them. And so in that way, the egregore is at the minimum invisible. But for you, as someone who's aware of what a goetic spirit is, it's potentially a very real thing. And so therefore it can manifest in a very real way for you. So if you make it real, if you make it known, if you make it possible in your own rationalization, the egregore then has an avenue through which it can work in your life directly in a way that you are able to identify. And part of what we do as magicians is we intentionally open that doorway. We, we, we cross the veil in that way. We cut the veil. We allow that to be true. We allow egregores to be real. And interestingly enough, when we do that, because memory is just like anything else in the universe, it is, it is all made up as part of the whole. It is just as conscious as anything else. Those, those memories become the masks for the archetypes which spawn them. Now, ooh, this is getting deep. What do I mean by that? You as a person like to think that you are individualized, that you are a product of your actions, decisions, and so on. But those decisions are based almost entirely on archetypes that you've identified with, or been in opposition with, or decided to be more like, etc. So, for example, um, people ha are on the spectrum of hero or villain, for example. Most people are heroes of their own story. Most people don't see themselves as villains. But most people have a hero archetype that they believe represents them or that they represent. And they do their best to follow that pattern, generally. That pattern may differ from what I consider a hero to be like and what you consider a hero to be like, but it is a thing, it is a pattern that is followed. That archetype, then, if you're following it, becomes what you really are. You are really an archetype of the hero and you are a mask of the hero. Now, this mask is your personality, your consciousness. I'm sorry, excuse me, not your consciousness, your, your egregore, your idea of who you are, your persona. When this body is done and when you have been, and when you're done with this story you're telling about yourself, because it can continue long after the body ceases, when you're done telling the story and you've decided, you know what, I'm going to give this back to the universe, I'm just going to let go, then you, as an individuated being, relinquish those memories and those ideas and you go on to something else and you become aware of something else and it's forgotten. However, those memories still exist in the collective and they are still animated by the same source of consciousness that animates who you think you are. So in other words, your consciousness is always animating the egregore. It's just that you may no longer be aware of it. So the spirit world is made up then, as we understand it, as black magicians working magic, working with the astral realm, calling spirits. Spirits then are the ideas, the collective ideas of humanity, both infernal and diabolical and divine and celestial and everything in between and everything above and below and all of these different ideas, anything within human capacity to reason exists in this sphere and much more. But we have access to all of these beings and people. In fact, any person that has ever lived, until their memories leave the collective consciousness, can be resurrected in magic. And when I say resurrected in, in a necromantic way, I don't mean you make their body rise again. I mean you can make their egregore rise again. So for example, it is possible to channel the spirit of almost any deceased person 
simply by learning enough about them, understanding who they'd probably be like, and then allowing your imagination to take hold, run away with the inspiration of the spirit realm, and trust it, and then verify it. And very often you'll find you, you make good decisions that way. You'll find that you were probably pretty accurate. So for example, if you're channeling George Washington, then you might think things that George Washington might have thought, and you might get close to what he might have actually believed had he been alive at this moment in the way that he used to be. However, he still kind of is, because his consciousness is your consciousness. It's all the same consciousness. It's just now George Washington is you, and he's trying to access the memories of who he used to be. Same thing works for King Paimon. Same thing works for Satan and Lucifer. Same thing works for Yahweh and Jehovah and all of these different deity forms, because they are archetypes that humanity either created based on a person or a thing that they saw. They, they anthropomorphized these archetypes, and they are masks for the archetypes themselves. And again, the archetypes themselves, they're not lifeless machines. They too are aware and conscious because they too are egregores in the ultimate sense, because they too are merely masks for the infinite, the divine, the true self that you are. That's all they are too. So maybe a good way to think of it would be like a Russian nesting doll or an onion, where no matter how many times you take a layer off, there's still something more under it. The infinity of that process is the whole, the forest with the trees in it. So you need to become aware. As you ascend and you become more and more enlightened, you become more and more aware of the truth of reality, of what you are, be it using infernal theurgy, celestial theurgy, divine theurgy, diabolical theurgy, shadow theurgy, whatever kind of theurgy you're doing. And theurgy means that you are literally joining with the infinite, joining with the divine, becoming divinity by, by invoking and experiencing these, these God forms and making yourself in their image and vice versa. You're, you're identifying, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit like Perseus. I'm a little bit like, uh, a little bit like Nyarlathotep. I'm a little bit like whatever God or spirit you like and emulating them in your personal life and then contacting that egregore and having it work in your life. Again, I'm not a superstitious person. I'm not into superstition. I poo-poo superstition. When people say, Thorne, you're disrespecting Satan by saying that, I say, good. Let's see what the adversary's got then. Maybe that'd be interesting. I'm not worried about that because I know that I am the adversary. I'm being adversarial when I say that, am I not? So here's my point. The spirit world is both within and without. It is the same thing as the material world. It's not the underside of the material world. It's not the overside of the material world. It's not up there. It's not down below. It is, as they say, the Baphomet. You are the Baphomet. It is all one thing. The spirit world and material world are one. Ultimately, they are one thing. It is our minds, however, that separate them apart because in order to understand, if you recall in the beginning of this video, I talked about how the intellect has to separate ideas to understand them. The mind separates the unity of the whole forest into its consequential parts, kind of inventing them because it kind of arbitrarily decides where one idea and another begins and, and ends. Um, it kind of arbitrarily says that, you know, hot is that way and cold is that way. Um, meanwhile, it could be inverted. It doesn't really matter, right? I mean, what is hot? What does hot mean exactly? Well, it means, uh, you know, uh, there's no temperature that is hot. Like if you ask a scientist what temperature constitutes hot, it's going to ask you, he's going to ask you from what plane of reference are you talking? You're talking about to a human being? Well, anything like over like 100 degrees is hot, right? Uh, to an ice cube, anything over 32 degrees is hot. Um, uh, uh, to a star, it's it, hot doesn't even compute until you get into some kind of astronomical number. So hot is not a thing. It is not, there is no hot. There is only temperature. Temperature is a spectrum, a gradient, a, a totality of what temperature means. Temperature is also part of a much larger whole. It is part of a much bigger picture. So that temperature becomes no different than hot or cold. In other words, temperature versus space, or temperature versus time, or temperature versus movement, or some other thing. I'm not quite sure what they would be. Because my brain doesn't go there. I can't, I can't quite penetrate that boundary and figure out what that is. Science hasn't yet either. But I'm here to tell you, the thing is, all of these higher concepts that we think we can't divide any further, it's just because our blade isn't sharp enough. If we could chop them up further, we would find that temperature or time or space or distance or anything that we consider an elemental truth of reality, 
is on a spectrum of a whole as well. And they are, temperature is over here and time is over here, but they are all part of the same continuum of the fractal. Whatever that fractal is, whatever that means to you, the source, the emanations of the source, um, uh, you know, the self, the consciousness, whatever that is for you, God, they are all part of that. They are all emanations of that. They are all parts of that fractal, little individual blips on it. And within each one creates its own pattern, creates its own identity, its, its own personal sphere of things that are associated with it. Because only things that are associated with temperature fit in the temperature part of the, of the, of the spectrum. In other words, you can't assign time to temperature because you don't understand how these things work. So to you, there's only hot and cold that fits within the temperature wheel. And in time, there's only past and present and future and so on. So these ideas are again archetypes. And these archetypes are part of a greater whole. And the spirit world is what happens when our minds look at reality and say, there's a difference between this and a skull. All right, guys, that's enough for now. This is D.H. Thorne signing off. I hope you guys enjoy this video. If you do, Make sure you go down to the uh, description of this video and check out the things I have on offer there. I have books that you might find useful. I also have a Teespring store and I have my Etsy store. Uh, I also have a Patreon, although I kind of prefer you buy something if you're going to send me any kind of money or anything. Purchase something that you get a product for if you can. Uh, but if you can't and don't want to do all that, simply like, share, and subscribe. All of that stuff helps me out. Tune in every week on Thursday. I have a live stream with my friend Flesh Priest. Flesh Priest. Flesh Priest. And we have a great show. Sometimes EA Quetting shows up, sometimes J.D. Temple shows up. We have great guests. And it's also a call-in show. So that means if you want to talk to me live and you can't afford a mentorship or a consultation, you can call in and I will help you as best I can in the time limit allowed. So if you guys are interested in that, join us every Thursday night. We do it at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We run till about one in the morning. Um, and it's a good time had by all. I promise you, we always have a good time. All right, guys, that's enough for today. Until next time, mind the shadows.